What we've learned today and in the two preceding days is uh, being a system to investigate uh, injuries that doesn't necessarily focus on the consequences of dysfunctions but on the contributors from the mechanical standpoint to the dysfunctions, biomechanical standpoint, which includes the arthrokinematics of the joints, whether they are intact joints or arthritic joints, which include the neuromuscular function, is a combined function of the peripheral nervous system with the spinal cord, and which include the metabolic, cellular, adaptive functions of the connective tissue, of the peripheral connective tissue that can directionally laid out the fibers of uh, tropocollagen and collagen and elastin to create preferred lines of tension that will help the body to absorb and distribute the loads that are imposed upon the system. This way, hold it there, look at the scapula. See that? How he has problems to stabilize, so and how this comes forward If we are guided only by the information that the patient perceives uh, and without examining the, the body in an uh, objective manner, we will blame tissues for uh, nociception that may not be responsible. So trigger points are most of the time part of my pre-treatment activities, not even treatment. It's not a treatment because the trigger point is a consequence, not a cause. Okay, so look here, Chris, hold it there. Look at the stabilization of the humeral head that we've accomplished. Remarkable. So that simplifies your life because you have two tools, movement and palpation. Pretty simple. And obviously visual. But even if, if you were blind, you could still examine with a great degree of accuracy without seeing. This is it. Okay, you happy you do it first, and then let me do it right after and see what the difference is. Because you, you've done it this time. Yeah, I'd like to have uh, practice to send my patients to the physician and present natural practice. The heels off the table. Yeah. Hold it here. Now, apart from a, a greater motor activity, you see how the function of uh, a stabilization of the humeral head of the infraspinatus is now carried properly. You can follow this direction, this direction, this direction, and that will test the tension of the different tissues. Segmental diagnosis allows simultaneously to identify peripheral abnormal function at these levels, arthrokinematic, muscular, peripheral neurological, connective tissue, but also segmental diagnosis allows us to identify the possible segmental dysfunction of the vertebral column uh, at the levels that supply those peripheral tissues. Show the body in. And now you got too much flex and you're starting to tighten up. Relax your shoulders. Relax. So we got contraction of the gluteus medius, maybe the gluteus minimus. So 
He's got the anterior delt coming in here. The, pe the anterior delt coming on top. The pec major coming in underneath. And then the biceps coming in through here. The subscap coming in. This area here is a high friction zone. And very commonly will have a lot of tension right in here. I'm trying to be uh, specific and not to go through other muscles. I'm going to angle the needle uh, a little bit proximal, be nice contraction of the sartorius. See, and that's normal, normal movement. Yeah. Okay. An integrated spinal peripheral model, it tells us that they are never or almost never isolated dysfunctions at the periphery without a segmental contribution. That's what clinical practice uh, teaches us. And this is a very valuable model. Indeed, if, if all you do is a little segmental diagnosis, identifying the segments uh, that are associated with the peripheral dysfunction and you treat those segments with lidocaine injections, with multi-segmental electroacupuncture, preferably with these two plus some sort of soft tissue and maybe joint manipulation. If all you do is that, to do that and a little peripheral tissue work, uh, you, you'll be very successful clinically. Like and then what I do is look, I'm like this and I'm hitting the wall, like look, the Achilles isn't that tight. That's so, so you know that it's not coming from the gastroc soleus because we're not even stressing it. It does a shorter, it has a shorter extension on the right. On this one? Yeah, this one feels good. This one's actually a little bit more restricted. So feel that, you actually can feel the gentle. I'm checking the medial gastro, the lateral gastro. The calcaneus gets stabilized when the gastrocs are activated and the stabilizer of the calcaneus is the, the tibialis. This is a good, good stability there. The position is, is stable. This corrects the, the arch. If I let it drop, see what happened? And that puts tension on the first radius. Obviously, these biomechanical factors are influenced by uh, central factors, such as the neurological programming of complex movement patterns, uh, such as gait or uh, motions, uh, such as hitting a golf ball, hitting a tennis ball, golf. Complex sports require a deeper analysis of the neuromechanical factors because uh, involve uh, a lot of uh, work on the higher levels. And, and today we've just used gait as already complex enough example of uh, the interactions between peripheral factors, central factors. And we've learned that it's possible from a qualitative analysis of a complex movement to extract valuable clinical information to generate therapeutic interventions that modify in a favorable manner the functional state uh, just by acting once again up on the, the four levels that is what uh, I'd be delighted that you take that to your practice tomorrow.